wanted to look at coupling patterns a little bit differently in this particular video. I'm revisiting a molecule that I've uh, looked at previously, especially in the context of uh, the powerful technique homonuclear decoupling that is simply one pentene. It's one of my favorite example molecules. It has just so many beautiful coupling patterns and it. it is just premier as far as the coupling patterns that you see in there, simple ones and complex ones. In this video, I want to approach the coupling patterns in pentene a little bit differently. Uh, instead of using homonuclear decoupling, I want to talk about how we actually measure the various coupling constants and how we can come to understand both the simple and the more complex coupling patterns that you see in this particular molecule. So getting started, let's take a look at the proton and MR spectrum of pentene and the structure of pentene itself. It integrates as beautifully as you would expect it to. Uh, it has all the chemical shifts you would expect to see. Uh, this group of upfield chemical shifts, uh, this group of downfield chemical shifts, the protons on the double bond itself. It is just stunningly beautiful to look at. Very few contaminants are in there. Beautiful molecule, beautiful spectrum. So now we're going to focus in on the upfield side of the molecule for a moment. This area here, this CH3, CH2, CH2 section, all single bonds, all the chemical shifts, uh, 2 ppm or less. And if we focus in on that particular region, we see some lovely coupling patterns here. Now in the molecule, I've taken the structure and labeled the various, uh, the, the three groups in here. They're simply group 1, 2, and 3. Uh, when we focus on the alkene side, I'm going to use letters instead to try to keep it straight. Numbers for the upfield side, letters for the downfield side. And taking a quick look at group 1, for example, the methyl group, a little bit less than 1. It has two neighbors over there in group 2. It is just a textbook perfect triplet. Just absolutely lovely. Over here at group 3, it's a quartet two neighbors on one side, uh, then the first alkene proton on the other. It's not a clean quartet. It's not as pretty as you would expect a quartet to be. There are other things going on. Uh, we'll worry about that one later. It's group two. It's the CH2 here right in the middle. It is a textbook sextet split into you know, uh, residents split into six different peaks. Now remember, you're going to get a sextet because you have a proton or a group of protons with five neighbors. And the coupling constants betwe between group two and its neighbors must all be identical. Now there's no way you're going to get something like a sextet by having a group of protons attached to one carbon that has five different protons attached to it. That doesn't happen. Organic chemistry profs get all wiggy about stuff like that. No, no, no. This has to be a group of protons, a CH2 group, that is near two different sets of protons. And it is. We know that the structure of the molecule is on one side there's a CH3, on the other side there's a CH2. We have five neighboring protons. So it's not a surprise we get a sex step. But I have to emphasize, the only way you get a sextet out of something like this is if the coupling constants between group 2 and group 1, between group 2 and group 3, are all identical or nearly identical to each other. So I'm going to show you how we go about measuring those coupling constants. First up, I'm going to focus in on the triplet for just a moment. This is going to give us a really nice clean measure of J12, the coupling constant between group 1 and group 2. Now what I've done is I've labeled two of these peaks not with their peak positions in ppm, but simply convert, uh, had it label uh, the peak positions in hertz. And to measure the coupling constant, really all you need to do is take the difference between these two numbers. And you come out with a, little, a number just a little over 7. Sure enough, a coupling constant in this aliphatic region where all the bonds are nice, pretty, classic single bonds. Coupling constant just above 7. Exactly what we'd expect to see here. Now let's go after the coupling constant between group 2 and group 3. For this one, we're going to focus in on the resonances of group 3. It is this quartet, kind of. There are other things happening in here. Now to get a good value for a coupling constant, you do want to find two peaks that represent 
the difference, the coupling constant, the actual separation between the various parts here. And you want to find two peaks that are as identical as possible. And that's why I've actually did my measurement on the first and last peak of this seeming quartet here, first and last group in this seeming quartet here, simply because uh, the middle peaks are taller, they're a little bit, a uh, little bit harder to look at or different. So what I did is I measured in, again in Hertz, the difference between these two peaks and then divided it by three uh, because I'm looking at three segments of this quartet here and I get a value once again uh, just a little over seven Hertz. So there it is. This is the coupling influence uh, between group two and group three, J23, just over seven Hertz, just like J12, just over seven Hertz. That is how you get a sextet. You have to have a proton or a group of protons under the influence of at least two different groups, adding up to five protons total, and the coupling constants between those groups have to be identical to each other, or nearly identical to each other, as they are in this case. So looking in on the sextet pattern, here it is. It is a classic textbook 1 to 5 to 10 to 10 to 5 to 1, the sixth row of Pascal's triangle sextet. It is just a stunningly beautiful pattern to look at. And you think that's fun? Oh, wait till we get down to the downfield section of this molecule. Over we go to the alkene side. And the moment you look at the alkene side of pentene, you realize we are not in simple coupling pattern territory anymore. Oh, there is coupling patterns here, but we aren't looking at doublets and we aren't looking at triplets. We are looking at all kinds of fascinating things happening in, in this area. Oh, it is just gorgeous to look at. Now here, I've labeled the peaks uh, with letters A, B, C, and D, and it's proton a that we're going to focus on. That is the most interesting one of the bunch here. That's the one up there at about 5.8 ppm. It's the most downfield uh, of the protons in this particular molecule. So now we're going to start digging into the coupling constants here. And to do that, I'm going to actually look at groups C and D up close first. So here they are. Now when you look at these, you can tell that they, they, they are closely related to each other, and in fact, someone, if they looked at it real quick, might go, oh, look, four peaks, it must be a quartet. No, there's nothing about a, it's not a quartet here. We don't see the classic one, three, three, one patterning, small peak, large, large, small peak, or anything. Somebody might say, oh, well, it must be a doublet of doublets. Now, a doublet of doublets is a possibility, but be careful. A doublet of doublets would give the the two outer, the separation between the outer peaks and the central peaks would have to be identical. Look at this thing carefully. Do you see different peak separations between the, uh, between these various peaks or groups of peaks in here? This is not a doublet, a doublet. What we are looking at here is actually the resonances or the, the peak positions of groups C and D. We are looking at a doublet for group C and a doublet for group D. Furthermore, there are other influences going on certainly here. Remember, in the coupling constant games and in protons, the largest coupling constants we typically will run across are those across a double bond in the trans position. So J, A, C is going to be our largest coupling constant here typically for trans protons, 16 hertz, somewhere in that neighborhood. So focusing in on these two peaks for a moment, or these two resonances, these are the peaks of, of group C. It is a large doublet because of the coupling back to group A. There are other coupling influences from D and even all the way out to the CH2 group right next to the carbon-carbon double bond, but it's the doublet that I'm after. So I take group C, I pick out two peaks that are in exactly equivalent positions in both branches, label them in hertz, 
take the difference between them, and I come out with a value of just over 17 hertz. Indeed, a very large trans coupling constant. And I take that value and I write it down. I'm going to make use of it in just a moment. Now I turn my attention to the other two peaks here. These are the resonances of group D, the cis coupling constant across the double bond. These are also large coupling constants, though not nearly as large as trans coupling constants, typically in the neighborhood of 10 hertz, somewhere in that area. Again, you notice they're not, they don't look quite the same as the two, as the, as the peaks for group C. For group D, they look a little bit different. But again, picking out two of them on each branch that are in ident equivalent positions, labeling them in hertz, taking the difference, I come out with a value of just over 10 hertz. Indeed, a perfect match to a cis coupling constant. I'll write that one down. And now for the coupling constant between uh, our, our friend group A and group B, the CH2 group of the upfield side of this molecule. Now to do this, it's going to cause group A to be split into a triplet. And I'm going to go to the resonance of group A, which does have a triplet component in it, and measure the difference between these two peaks here, again in hertz, and I get a value of just under 7 hertz, 6.69 hertz in this case. Classic single bond coupling constant, around 7 hertz. Here, just a little bit less than 7. Uh, and that is going to be our third coupling influence for group A. We have the very large 17 hertz trans coupling, the large but not as large cis coupling from group A to group D, and then the classic aliphatic just under 7 hertz coupling from group A to group B. Now to really tie all this together, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start simulating uh, this coupling pattern and show how it evolves as we add more of the coupling influences and how we eventually can create a pattern that is identical to the actual measured resonance for group A. So here we go. What we see here as on the top is group A's actual measured uh, resonance spread out over the you know entire width of the paper, the width of the screen. So you can see the glorious pattern beautifully. Below it is the simulated spectrum. And what I've done is I've created a, a told the simulator in MNOVA to give me a peak at 5.8 ppm and at the moment have no coupling influences on it. So you can see here I've drawn it out and I've set all the coupling constants at the moment to zero. That gives simulated A, a it's a singlet, right in the dead center of the actual spectrum, group A. Now I'm going to turn on the three coupling influences one at a time, starting with the largest and working my way down to the smallest. And watch how the signal for simulated group A evolves as we do that. First we turn on the trans coupling, the 17 hertz trans coupling. In Sure enough, the simulated signal of group A divides from the singlet into a doublet, a wide doublet, with the two branches of the doublet separated by a coupling constant of over 17 hertz. Now we're going to turn on the second coupling, the cis coupling constant, and watch what happens to each branch of this doublet as we add the second coupling influence. Now the two coupling constants are turned on, the 17 hertz trans coupling, the 10 hertz cis coupling constant. And the two branches of our doublet has now each divided into another set of doublets. We now have a doublet of doublets. Here are the four peaks of the simulated group A under two coupling influences now. Doesn't look like the actual group A yet, but we're getting there. Now we have to turn on the third coupling constant. This is group A back to group B, the one that has a coupling constant just under 7 hertz, the 6.69 hertz. This is going to take each branch of our doublet of doublets 
and divide it into a one to one ratio triplet. Watch how this happens. Now each branch of the doublet of doublet is divided into a triplet. And now we see simulated A here at the bottom and the actual measured pattern for group A of pentene are identical to each other. We have indeed extracted out from the spectra the values for the coupling constants. And we've come to understand that group A here is a proton under the influence of four other protons spread over three different groups and the coupling constants are all different, very different from each other. We have a classic, beautiful, exquisite doublet of doublets of triplets for group A in pentene. And finally, one last bit of fun. What if we have group A under the influence of four adjacent protons, but all the coupling constants were identical? That's easy to simulate. Here's what it would look like. And it should come as no great shock that group A in this situation would look like a classic 14641 pentet the fifth row of Pascal's triangle. It would be a lovely pattern. It's not what we see. Absolute convincing proof that group A is coupled to many different nuclei, three different groups with very different coupling constants. That is how you get these gloriously intricate multiple coupling patterns. And so I leave you with the actual spectrum on top simulated spectrum on the bottom. The fact that they match each other so beautifully is just, just inspir inspirational. It is just beautiful to look at. Coupling patterns in protons, living, breathing quantum mechanics made manifest so we can see it easily on our computer screens, on paper. Beautiful stuff to look at. Hope this helps unravel some of these coupling patterns and how they can go from simple to intricate, but how we can understand that and untangle them. Talk to you later.